Good afternoon. Good to see everyone. Uh, today, I once again have the privilege of introducing and welcoming Secretary Blinken back to this uh, briefing room so that he can mark the release of the 2021 Human Rights Report. Secretary Blinken will have some opening remarks and then he'll take a couple questions. After that, I will then introduce Lisa Peterson, who's the Acting Assistant Secretary of the Bureau uh, of Democracy, Human Rights of Labor. Uh, Acting Assistant Secretary Peterson will have remarks of her own and then she will stick around for a few more questions and then we'll proceed with our regularly scheduled programming. Uh, so without further ado, Secretary Blinken. Ned, thank you very much. So we've got a full program for you this afternoon. Um, I'm very pleased to be here with Acting Assistant Secretary of State uh, for the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights and Labor, Lisa Peterson, uh, to indeed introduce the 2021 uh, Human Rights Report. So this is the second time that uh, I've joined the launch of this report as Secretary uh, because it's important to U.S. foreign policy, it's important to this department, it's important to me personally. Uh, for many years running, we have seen an alarming recession of democracy, the rule of law, respect for human rights in many parts of the world. Uh, in the time since releasing our previous report, that backsliding has, unfortunately, continued. Uh, in few places have the human consequences of this decline been as stark as they are in the Russian government's brutal war uh, on Ukraine. That's especially true in recent weeks. As Russian forces have been pushed back from towns and cities they occupied or surrounded, and evidence mounts of their widespread atrocities. We see what this receding tide is leaving in its wake. The bodies, hands bound, left on streets. The theaters, train stations, apartment buildings, reduced to rubble with civilians inside. We hear it in the testimonies of women and girls who've been raped and the besieged civilians starving and freezing to death. In response, people and governments in every region are voicing their condemnation and calling for those responsible to be held accountable. This global outcry has been clarifying. In its disdain for human life and dignity, the Kremlin has reinvigorated a belief in people worldwide that there are human rights that everyone everywhere should enjoy and underscore why these rights are worth defending. At the same time, uh, civil society, governments, and people around the world are rightly pointing out that Ukraine is, tragically, far from the only place where gross abuses are being perpetrated. They want the international community to shine a spotlight on human rights abuses wherever they're being committed and to bring the same urgency to stopping abuses and holding perpetrators accountable. The United States shares that goal. This report is just one of the ways that we're working to achieve it. It contains individual chapters on nearly 200 countries and territories, each of which offers factual, objective, and thorough accounting of their records on internationally recognized human rights. Whether a country is a friend or one with which we have real differences, the measuring stick we apply is the same. That reflects a core principle of human rights. They're universal. People of every nationality, race, gender, disability, and age are entitled to these rights, no matter what they believe, whom they love, or any other characteristics. This is especially important as a number of governments continue to claim falsely that human rights need to be applied based on the local context. Little coincidence that many of the same governments uh, are among the worst abusers of human rights. The universal nature of human rights also means that we have to hold ourselves accountable to the same standards. Even as this report looks outward to countries around the world, we've acknowledged from day one of this administration that we have challenges here in the United States. We take seriously our responsibility to address these shortcomings, and we know that the way to do it matters. Uh, together with citizens and communities, out in the open, transparently, not trying to pretend problems don't exist or sweeping them under a rug. And in fact, that's what distinguishes democracies, our willingness, our commitment to pursue that more perfect union. And practicing what we preach at home gives us greater legitimacy when we encourage governments abroad to do the same thing. The report also shows that the United States is concerned not only with civil and political rights, but also economic, social, cultural rights. That means, for example, 
affirming that promoting access to education and health services, including for reproductive health, is just as critical to advancing human rights as defending freedom of expression and assembly. These interconnected rights are critical to ensuring individuals can reach their full potential, and they're critical to sustaining healthy democracy. So with that context, let me highlight some of the most alarming findings of the report, which I want to emphasize covers the events of 2021. Governments are growing more brazen in reaching across borders to threaten and attack critics. To give just a few examples, over the last year alone, Iranian intelligence agents plotted to kidnap an Iranian-American journalist from her home in Brooklyn. The Assad regime threatened Syrians who were cooperating with efforts in Germany's courts to prosecute former officials for atrocities. The Lukashenko regime in Belarus forcibly diverted an international commercial flight to arrest an independent journalist. Governments are locking up more critics at home. Today, more than a million political prisoners are being held in over 65 countries. They include more than 600 people unjustly imprisoned in Cuba for taking part in peaceful protests last July. Countless Russian anti-corruption activists and opposition leaders, including Alexei Navalny, opposition presidential candidates in Benin, and Egyptian advocates like human rights lawyer Mohamed al-Bakr. We've also seen a rise in governments arbitrarily detaining individuals to try to gain leverage in bilateral relationships, to use them as human pawns. The Chinese government continues to commit genocide and crimes against humanity in Xinjiang, against predominantly Muslim Uyghurs, among other minority groups, to erode fundamental freedoms and uh, autonomy in Hong Kong, and to carry out systematic repression in Tibet. In Afghanistan, the Taliban's takeover precipitated a humanitarian crisis and has resulted in, in a serious erosion of human rights, from arbitrary detentions of women, uh, protesters and journalists, to reprisals against security forces from the former government, to growing restrictions on where women and girls can study or work. In Ethiopia, all parties to the country's conflict as well as Eritrean forces, have committed atrocities, and thousands of Ethiopians are being unjustly detained in life-threatening conditions. We invest so much effort into documenting these and other abuses year after year, not only because it aligns our most sacred values, but also because respect for human rights is a fundamental part of upholding the international rules-based order, which is crucial to America's enduring security and prosperity. Governments that violate human rights are almost always the same ones that flout other key parts of that order, just as, uh, such as invading, coercing, uh, or threatening trade rules, uh, excuse me, threatening other countries, or breaking trade rules. So our interest in standing up for human rights isn't only principled, it is vital to our national security. Here are some of the other ways that we're working to support human rights. When senior members of the State Department travel abroad, we meet with human rights advocates, with journalists and other frontline defenders, as do our ambassadors at every post, even when foreign governments make it clear that they wish we would not. We work with the Treasury Department to apply sanctions and impose visa restrictions on human rights abusers and those who enable and profit from them through the Global Magnitsky Act, the Khashoggi Ban, and other tools. We methodically collect, preserve, and analyze evidence of atrocities and make this information available to the appropriate bodies. Indeed, it was the Department's rigorous documentation, which included our own fact-finding and reports by a range of independent, impartial sources, including human rights organizations, that provided a basis for my determination last month that Burma's military committed genocide and crimes against humanities against Rohingya. We work with business to foster greater respect for human rights both by encouraging compliance with labor standards and discouraging exports to governments and other entities that may use those goods or services to commit abuses. We're fully engaged in multilateral institutions, even flawed ones. After regaining a seat on the UN Human Rights Council, we just led a successful effort to suspend Russia from that body. Because a country that's perpetrating gross and systematic violations of human rights shouldn't sit on a body whose job it is to protect those rights. And we're working to strengthen democracy, human rights, and the fight against corruption through the Summit for Democracy. Uh, last December, President Biden convened 100 world leaders 
as well as representatives from civil society and the private sector for the first summit. That kicked off the year of action that we're in the midst of pursuing. We're focused on delivering progress, not just pronouncements, by encouraging countries to make concrete commitments to advance human rights and democracy. And we're holding one another to our pledges. Before turning to questions, let me just thank everyone who's had a hand in producing this report. Uh, this is uh, an enterprise that cuts across the entire State Department. We have local staff and career officers in posts around the world, as well as here in Washington, whose determination and rigor are shining a bright light on these issues every single day. And the brave human rights defenders, journalists, and others documenting those abuses from up close, frequently at grave risk to themselves and their loved ones. This is your report, too, and we thank you for it. So we're approaching the 15-month mark since this administration took office. We still don't have a confirmed assistant secretary for the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. Outstanding career officers have stepped up uh, to lead a devoted DRL team that carries this mission forward. And I want to thank you, Lisa, in particular, for exceptional service and stewardship in this time. But for the United States to be the best possible advocate of human rights and democracy worldwide, we need a Senate-confirmed assistant secretary. We have a highly qualified nominee for this position, Sarah Margon. I urge the Senate Foreign Relations Committee to allow her nomination to move forward soon. With that, happy to start taking some questions, and then I'll turn it over to Lisa. Good. Um, could you talk about how you um, think about uh, the tension between the desire to elevate um, human rights as part of American foreign policy and the desire to halt this recession that you mentioned um, with the need to shore up alliances um, that are seen as crucial to American interests um, with some countries that have problematic human rights records? I'm thinking of Egypt and its relationship with the Palestinian authorities or Saudi Arabia and its oil supplies. How do you think about that tension, and how do you respond to the criticism um, that the United States is implicitly condoning abuses by those governments? So this is not a new tension. In, in, in some ways, it's an age-old one. And administrations that um, in the past, and now ours, uh, that are putting human rights and democracy uh, front and center in their foreign policy have to confront it. And we work through it uh, every single day. It's different from country to country partner to partner, circumstance to circumstance. But I think what we're doing is uh, to just be very forthright in uh, what we uh, stand for, what we look for, uh, and we try to work with, uh, with countries to make, uh, to make progress. Uh, and again, this varies from, uh, from place to place. But uh, we're not holding back in, in, in what we're saying. We're not holding back in what we're, we're trying to do. But we also are looking carefully to determine how we think we can be most effective uh, in advancing the ball, and whether that is um, uh, focusing uh, in public on some of the concerns, shortcomings, problems that we're seeing, whether that's um, pushing people uh, in private, we have to make that judgment in each and every case. Having said that, this report, uh, a public report, uh, is very clear uh, about the uh, issues, challenges, concerns we have uh, across the world with uh, nearly 200 countries. And as I said before, it doesn't distinguish between friend and, and foe. Uh, we, uh, we apply the same standard everywhere. We do it publicly, as in this report. Uh, we do it publicly often when I have an opportunity to speak, including in the countries that we're visiting where we have concerns. But again, part of this is making uh, determinations on how uh, we think we can be uh, most effective. And in most cases, this is a process. It's not flipping a, flipping a switch. Uh, we don't expect that, that things will change from one day to the other. It's the result of sustained uh, engagement and trying to move, move partners along. Finally, I'd just say that I think we have, in a, in a way, added credibility precisely because when it comes to our own shortcomings at home, we're not dodging them, we're not ignoring them, we're not denying them. We're confronting them directly. And in so doing, we strengthen our position, we strengthen our voice in uh, advancing rights. But again, this is a... Uh, this is a process. Uh, it's, not, um, it's not something that happens from, from one day to the next. We're engaged in it. Let's see uh, where we are over the, the coming years and uh, the progress that we make in individual places. Francesca. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. You 
were mentioning the situation in Ukraine. Have you made an assessment of any alleged use of chemical agents or weapons in uh, Ukraine? And how credible would you say the reports coming from the Mariupol era um, are? Or do you have any intelligence mm. about any imminent use of chemical weapons? So when it comes to the reports you're referring to, uh, we're not in a position to confirm anything. I don't think the uh, Ukrainians are either. Um, but let me say this. We uh, had credible information that Russian forces may use a variety of riot control agents, uh, including tear gas, mixed with chemical agents that would cause uh, stronger symptoms uh, to weaken and incapacitate entrenched uh, Ukrainian fighters and civilians uh, as part of the aggressive campaign to take Mariupol. Uh, we share that information with, uh, with Ukraine, uh, as well as with other uh, partners. And we're in uh, direct conversation with partners uh, to try to determine what, uh, what actually is, has happened. So this is a, a real concern. It's a concern that we had from before the aggression started. I think um, I pointed to the, the possibility uh, that um, these kinds of weapons would, uh, would be used. Uh, and it's something that we're very, very focused on. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. All right. Lisa, over to you. Thanks, folks. See you later. Can we speak about Russia more Thank you. specifically in the opposition? Thanks, Andrea. Uh, Andrea Kuzmich, Washington Post. Um, I'm interested in your thoughts on the Russian response to the Ukraine. It's a privilege to be here for the release of the 46th Human Rights Report, which we submitted to the U.S. Congress earlier today. For nearly five decades, the United States has issued the country reports on human rights practices, addressing the status of internationally recognized human rights in all countries that are members of the United Nations. The annual Human Rights Report includes 198 reports on individual countries and territories and provides an objective record of whether and how human rights and fundamental freedoms are protected by law and in practice around the world. The individual reports draw on information from a range of governmental, non-governmental, and media sources. The Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor, which I currently lead, is at the forefront of preparing these reports along with colleagues across the department and our embassies in the field. And I'm proud to note that this June, we will mar mark our 45th anniversary. In 1977, the Carter administration oversaw the establishment of what is now the DRL Bureau with the mission of advancing individual liberty and democratic freedoms around the world and upholding the truth enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that all individuals are born equal in dignity and rights. Over those four and a half decades, DRL has rolled up our sleeves alongside US government colleagues, as well as countless brave human rights defenders and other civil society leaders to promote our namesake values of democracy, human rights, and labor. Despite innumerable achievements over that period to defend and strengthen democracy and to promote and protect human rights and labor rights, serious challenges persist. Some of today's challenges to democracy and human rights are long-standing and familiar. Others are new and evolving. All demand continued leadership from the United States in close collaboration with our partners and allies across the globe. On the home front, strengthening our democracy in the United States and ensuring that the fundamental freedoms and human rights of all people are protected and advanced is a critical part of the Biden-Harris administration's commitment to global leadership on human rights. We can't be credible advocates for human rights abroad if we don't live up to the same principles at home. We do not claim a moral high ground, but we do, in the words of our Constitution, resolve to form a more perfect union, which means we must continue to address the many human rights challenges in our own country. The Summit for Democracy, held this past December, served as a rallying point to address these challenges, both new and old. President Biden brought together world leaders, civil society, and private sector representatives in a shared commitment to push back against authoritarianism, fight corruption, and advance respect for human rights. 
We're taking forward the momentum of the first summit through a year of action in which governments, including the United States, are working to fulfill our commitments and tackle human rights challenges at home and globally in partnership with civil society. The yearly Human Rights Report speaks to the importance that we place on these goals. The report does not attempt to catalog every human rights related incident. It is not an effort by the U.S. government to judge others. It does not reach legal conclusions, rank countries, or draw comparisons. We've seen all too well in recent years that around the world, democracy and human rights have been threatened and undermined by disinformation, misinformation, and outright lies. So our objective with the Human Rights Report is simple. Bring the facts to the table. It is only when we're armed with the truth that the United States can most effectively use our voice and our influence to call attention to violations and abuses of human rights worldwide and press the perpetrators of these violations and abuses to change course and end their egregious conduct. At the conclusion of this press briefing, the 2021 Human Rights Report will be available to the public on the State Department website at www.state.gov. Thank you for being here today, and with that, I'm happy to take your questions. Yes. Um, hello, Vita Arganda, Voice of America, President Sobe. Uh, the Secretary um, just mentioned Iran as one of the examples of the countries where human rights violation is rampant, and he uh, referred to uh, abduction or attempt to abduct dissidents uh, overseas. A little over a year ago, the Secretary also issued a statement um, designating a number of IRGC commanders for having a hand in um, the arrest, uh, imprisonment, and torture of protesters a couple of years ago. And in continuation of that statement, uh, the Secretary said that the U.S. will continue to support the Iranian people. Now, how has the Biden administration helped or supported the Iranian people during this past year, given that the uh, list of violations of human rights on Iran in the report is, I don't know, 10, 15 uh, lines long? So we continue to find ways, both in public and in very discreet manners, to support uh, people who are trying to advance the human rights situation in Iran. Um, as you note, we have also put into play a variety of sanctions tools. Um, I am sorry, I don't have details in front of me at this moment, but it is something that I would be happy to circle back to you on. Thank you. Thank you. Um, on the North Korean human rights issues, uh, human rights violations are currently uh, ongoing in North Korea. And North Korean leader Kim Jong-un is um, massacred their own citizens. What is the uh, final destination for the United States to resolve the North Korean human rights problem? So we do recognize that the DPRK is among the most repressive authoritarian states in the world. And obviously, we remain deeply concerned about reports of systemic, widespread, and gross human rights violations and abuses committed by the DPRK government. And we certainly hope that one day justice may be achieved for the people of North Korea. Um, similar to the very difficult operating circumstances with Iran, we continue to work with the international community to raise awareness document and preserve information on human rights abuses and violations and increase access to independent information. Um, we also seek to impose sanctions on those who are Im complicit in abuses and, vi and violations and, as always, promote respect for human rights within the DPRK. Do you have any tools used for the resolve of these human rights issues in North Korea, or you don't have anything because this is a long time being the North Korean human rights abuse the human rights issues. Um, obviously, that is an extremely difficult environment to be able to influence, but it is an area that we continue to 
focus our efforts on to try to raise awareness around the issues within North Korea. Yes. Assess the human rights uh, record in the Middle East. Uh, are they deteriorated, or how do you how do you see them? Um, I would hesitate to speak to the Middle East as a region as a whole. Uh, each country has its individual circumstances. Um, some have progress, some less so. Um, so I would hesitate to speak on an entire region. On uh, Russia, the um, report obviously covers the 2021 period, but Russia seems to be committing even worse atrocities this year in Ukraine and its repression at home. I would wonder if you would agree with that characterization. And then secondly, if you could uh, expand on why that would be the case. Do you think that Vladimir Putin um, has a sense of impunity because he hasn't faced repercussions in the past? So I will share that, you know, because the report does focus on 2021 and a lot of the preparation is very focused on what went into those reports, I was struck by the, the manner in which the listing of issues with Russia um, have simply been amplified in the context of the Russia-Ukraine context. Um, as to why that has happened, I will not speculate on what is motivating Putin. Um, there are some serious concerns about Georgia's human rights record. Um, many believe uh, within the country and uh, my respondents here in D.C., former diplomat, that Georgia is leaning towards illiberalism. Um, Secretary Blinken mentioned that um, it's irrespective to friends or not friendly countries. That applies, that human, right, human rights um, standard applies equally to everyone. I just want to gather your thoughts, how far is the United States willing to go further if the former partners, and Georgia has been partnering with the U.S. for the last 30 years, is violating systematically human rights within its territory. Thank you. So clearly we do have a list of human rights concerns with Georgia. Um, I will also note um, that we have been following actions such as the October elections. Um, and there, while those were characterized as candidates generally being able to campaign freely, um, but there were observations from OSCE observers that the competitive environment was marred by widespread and consistent allegations of intimidation. Um, I do think that this is an, an appropriate example of how we do see problems in countries and we use the human rights reports to analyze and understand those problems. But in understanding and analyzing, we try to find ways to move forward. And as long as there is um, opportunity for engagement with, an, with a government, we will continue to engage on those human rights issues. Um, hi, thank you. I know that the report covers last year, but I just wanted to ask you something a little bit more um, contemporary. Um, there has been a lot of reporting, um, an increase in reporting of accounts of rape and sexual violence from Ukraine. Um, UN human rights monitors are seeking to verify these alleg um, allegations of sexual violence by Russian forces. Is that something the United States is picking up? And do you think that it has reached a level where rape is used as a weapon of war? So the reports of sexual violence are certainly um, something that we are tracking both in our own efforts to understand what is happening in Ukraine, in our own efforts to catalog what is happening there, um, and through the various um, citizen level mechanisms and multilateral approaches that are all gathering information. Um, we are hearing horrific stories. I'm sure you are hearing horrific stories as well. And that is something that we will continue to gather and ultimately, ideally, have it feed into um, transitional justice mechanisms. Yes. Thank you. Well, following up 
bit on that as well. Sorry to bring it back to Ukraine. Um, there's also been um, a claim by the Ukraine's UN ambassador that Russia has taken more than 121,000 children uh, out of Ukraine um, and is reportedly drafting a bill to simplify and accelerate adoption procedures for orphans. Um, this is something obviously coming from the Ukrainian side. Um, is this something that, uh, that the US is also tracking and looking into in terms of the kind of behavior that is being reported by the Ukrainians? This is certainly something that we have heard about. Um, this is something that we will continue to try to learn more about and try to determine wh what action may be possible. Final question? Yes. Um, yes. Um, these reports every year include a lot of details about LGBTQ rights abroad, and I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about folks who might be critical of of that in the context of what's happening here in the United States with bills like the Don't Say Gay Bill in Florida, efforts to um, um, discriminate against transgender folks, et cetera. Any thoughts on that point? So, you know, this will not be the first issue on which people will say, well, what about your own country? Um, I do think again, within the framing of the Summit for Democracy and the, the approach that this administration has taken, um, we're not trying to pretend that these are not issues that, that we are grappling with here in the United States. Um, this report, because it is very clearly focused on the rest of the world, we, we do dig in on other countries. We do not have a mandate to do a report on our own circumstances. Final question, Andrea. Uh, the, any comment on uh, Russia's arrest of uh, Kyle Mercer just hours after he appeared on two American networks from Moscow speaking out against the Russian war? Um, I would speak in general about Russia's crackdown, uh, further crackdown on freedom of information, freedom of expression in Russia in the context of the Ukraine conflict. Um, this was space that they were closing even before the conflict started. Um, their efforts to close down that space have um, simply grown exponentially since the start of the conflict. And we would want to see that space re reopened um, so that Russians can understand what, what is happening um, within their neighborhood and what their government is doing. Thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> Hopefully sooner. Um, let me actually start where you left off, Andrea, and, and to go back to a, a point that uh, Connor raised. And with the arrest of uh, Vladimir Karamurza, um, to, to add a little more uh, detail uh, to this, uh, this is someone who has previously endured arrests uh, and even near fatal poisonings in connection with nothing more than his peaceful activities on, beha on behalf of the human rights and civil liberties of the Russian people. Uh, we've urged Russia to cease the abuse of rep repressive laws that it has used to target its own citizens, nonviolent demonstrators, peaceful protesters, individuals who are doing nothing more uh, than advocating, again, peacefully on behalf of what are rights that are as universal to them as they are to people around the world. Uh, the Russian people, and this is the, the key point, like people everywhere, have the right to speak, to speak freely, uh, to form peaceful associations, uh, to exercise their freedom of expression, uh, and to have their voices heard through free and fair elections. And Connor, you asked about the trends we're seeing in, in Russia. And certainly, anecdotally at least, uh, we do seem to be seeing uh, a crackdown, a, a regime that is more aggressive beyond its borders and more repressive within its borders. We've seen that last year. Uh, we spoke about that in the context of uh, the arrest of Alexei Navalny, the subsequent arrest, a detention of the thousands of individuals who, again, peacefully took to the streets to protest his detention. Uh, we've seen that just over the past 24 hours with the arrest of Vladimir Karamurza. Uh, we've seen that in recent weeks with the detention of more than 15,000 
Russians who took to the streets to protest what their own government is doing purportedly in their name uh, and the subsequent crackdown that we've seen in towns and cities across Russia, from Moscow to St. Petersburg, Vladimir Putin's hometown, uh, to uh, towns and cities uh, across the country. I think if you look at this, these are not the actions of a government that is competent. Uh, these are the actions of a government, of a regime, that is fundamentally insecure, uh, that is not willing to allow its own people uh, to do what is the right of every people everywhere, uh, to voice their protests, to march peacefully, to form associations, uh, and to make their voices and their free will heard. Andrea. In a related, related issue, in clear rejection of the President's appeal to President Xi, China is reportedly increasing its echo chamber of the Russian false statements about atrocities, false claims that it was Ukraine that staged a lot of these atrocities. Um, is there any anything more between the U.S. and Beijing in trying to get them to not propagate these propaganda from Russia. These lies. This has been a topic between, uh, to include at the highest levels, between the United States and uh, the PRC. Uh, President Biden uh, did have an opportunity to address this. Uh, other senior officials in this government have had an opportunity uh, to address this. The fact is, at the end of the day, uh, the PRC is going to make their own choices about their partnerships, their alliances, uh, their actions, and their messaging. And this would not be the first time that we have seen false propaganda emanate from uh, the organs of uh, the PRC. It won't be the last time. Our concern, however, is that this time is different because the issue is not the sort of run-of-the-mill propaganda uh, that we expect to hear uh, from governments that uh, – have something of an adversarial relationship with the truth on occasion. Uh, this is an effort that may seek to provide cover uh, to Russia's potential plans uh, to employ some of the most heinous weapons uh, in their arsenal uh, against uh, the free people of Ukraine. We are concerned, as we've said before, that Russia may seek to resort to chemical weapons. We're concerned on the basis of a few elements. We know that Russia has a track record. Russia has used these agents against its own people on Russian soil, on European soil. Uh, Russia is engaging in the practice of projection, uh, projecting onto whether it's Ukraine, whether it's the United States, what they themselves uh, may be planning to do in, in terms of the false uh, lies that there are active chemical weapons programs on uh, Ukrainian soil, or that the United States is somehow involved uh, in any chemical weapons program on Ukrainian soil, uh, both uh, outright lies. And of course, we know that this is not a campaign that has gone according to plan for Vladimir Putin. And you can make that judgment on the basis of uh, any number of facts, but at the most basic level, uh, and we have declassified this, you've heard this from our CIA director, uh, this was a campaign that Vladimir Putin thought would land his forces in Kyiv within 48 or 72 hours, very shortly uh, after the initiation of aggression against Ukraine. We're now more uh, than five weeks into Russia's war against Ukraine. Russia has lost the Battle of Kyiv. Its forces are retreating, uh, and Russia's tactics are becoming uh, even more brutal. So. The Secretary was asked earlier about uh, reports. Uh, we're not in a position to confirm uh, anything at this time, but we've long voiced our concern, and long voiced our concern uh, that any government uh, would seek to lend any degree of credibility uh, to what appear to be nothing more than outright lies, uh, seeking to cover, obfuscate uh, what Russia may be planning to do in terms of the employment of, of chemical weapons. Uh, uh, Kyla, I'll come back that. Um, could you provide any more clarity on uh, the U.S. role in confirming these reports? Um, have you guys just offered 
to assist in determining if these chemical weapons were used, or is there an active process underway um, and you guys are part of that process or you're viewing any evidence and the like? So this in some ways started before the reports that emerged yesterday, and you heard from the Secretary just a moment ago, that we had developed credible information uh, preceding the reports uh, that came to the fore yesterday, uh, that Russia's forces may use a variety of riot control agents, and that includes tear gas mixed with chemical agents that would cause stronger symptoms, uh, as part of the effort to weaken uh, and, in and incapacitate uh, entrenched Ukrainian uh, fighters and even civilians uh, as part of its campaign to take Mariupol. We've had uh, a dialogue with our Ukrainian partners. We shared uh, this intelligence with them as we have shared uh, a great deal of intelligence and information uh, with them, both tactical uh, and strategic, and we shared the gist of this publicly, uh, at least in terms of uh, the outlines of our concerns that Russia may be seeking to use to employ uh, chemical weapons. Uh, we are, we already have been in direct conversations with our Ukrainian partners uh, as they are collecting uh, facts and evidence. We do stand ready to assist uh, in case we can be uh, useful in terms of that investigation, whether it is any sort of technical capability uh, or anything else. Um, but uh, uh, the Ukra our Ukrainian partners know that we're uh, standing ready. Um, and, you know, given that your intelligence predicted that this was in the realm of possibility, um, can you detail any specific protective equipment or anything that the United States has provided to Ukrainians, gas masks, protective clothing? We've heard a lot about weapons, but we haven't heard uh, a ton about those things. Have you provided those um, necessities to the Ukrainians? Yes, so we have uh, provided uh, uh, material uh, and protect protective equipment uh, to our Ukrainian partners uh, in, in, uh, to protect them uh, from the potential use of uh, chemical weapons. We can get you uh, a broader inventory of what that looked like. And that's already there. Uh, we've provided that to them, okay. yes. Thank you. And just to follow up on what the Secretary said and you just repeated, when you, you say you have uh, credible information, uh, even if it was before the, the latest reports, is that recent information about those, this possible use of chemicals? It's recent information. It was recent information that was available to us before uh, the reports emerged yesterday. Yes, Your Honor. Um, you know, this might have switched gears a little bit to still talk about Ukraine, but um, can you talk a little bit about how the United States views the potential um, NATO membership or replication of Sweden and Finland? This was discussed in last week's NATO summit. Is this, um, can you guys like um, outright say this is something you welcome in light of these repeated statements from Russia saying that you know, it would lead to instability and there's ver there are various views that might be seen as some provocation or anything like that? Can you just outline your U.S. thinking around that? Please? Sure. Well, as you know, the United States, nor any other country, nor any other ally, uh, does not speak on behalf of NATO. Uh, this would be a decision for uh, the alliance to make uh, when it comes to the aspirations of any uh, aspirant country. Um, what I can say and what we do support is the principle of NATO's open door. It should be up to the members of the alliance uh, in no other country to determine what NATO's roster looks like uh, if there are aspirant countries uh, that are raising their hands that meet the stringent criteria that NATO has put forward, uh, that would uh, be a decision for uh, the NATO alliance to make. Do you anticipate that these, these membership applications are likely to come through because of what's been happening regarding the war in Ukraine? I, I would have to refer you to any aspirant countries to speak to the status of their applications. Uh, for uh, joining the NATO alliance. But uh, I will say this, and without speaking to any uh, NATO allies uh, beyond, potential NATO allies beyond the, third, the 30 uh, current NATO allies, the point that the Secretary has consistently made, uh, that Vladimir Putin has precipitated everything he has sought to prevent, uh, I think is showcased here. We are now five, six weeks into this war in Ukraine. Uh, in many ways, this is a strategic defeat for Russia already, and one of the ways it's a strategic defeat uh, is because the international community, and NATO in particular, has never been stronger, has never been more united, has never been more purposeful 
uh, since the end of the Cold War. And you can measure that in the level of consensus and unanimity that has emanated from recent uh, sessions of the NAC, the recent foreign ministerial that took place uh, in Brussels, but you can also measure it in some ways quantitatively in terms of the number of U.S. service members uh, who are now uh, in Europe. It's uh, increased from, from, from some 60,000 to now over 100,000 uh, to the capabilities uh, that NATO has at its disposal, uh, to the steps that the alliance has taken uh, to reassure uh, countries on NATO's eastern flank. All of this is done defensively in reaction to the offensive operations that Vladimir Putin is undertaking inside of Ukraine. So, None of this. So, so what do you exactly make of Kremlin saying that the possible accession of Sweden, Finland would not bring stability to Europe? Is that, is that a threat? I, as a general matter, without speaking to uh, any specific Kremlin statements, uh, NATO is a defensive alliance. Uh, the, how the strengthening of a defensive alliance would bring anything uh, other than additional stability and security, uh, that's not something that um, uh, I have a hard time imagining. Yes. Um, speaking of uh, alliances with NATO and all the work that this administration has done in the lead up to this conflict, um, there's a very important presidential election going on in France. Uh, how concerned is the U.S. about uh, the possibility of Marine Le Pen uh, becoming the leader of a country like France, who you've obviously worked very hard with in terms of alliances against uh, the Kremlin and displaying unity within between U.S. and Europe? This is a question for the people of France. Uh, France is uh, our oldest ally, uh, but this is a, a question for the French people, uh, and they will uh, uh, exercise their right to vote in the coming days. Yes. Nearly three weeks ago now, the administration announced that it would accept up to 100,000 Ukrainian refugees. Can you give us any update on what your plans are to actually do that? Well, this is a question that we are working on right now with uh, colleagues throughout the administration, including in the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, the statement that the president made from Warsaw is that the United States would uh, seek to admit up to 100,000 Ukrainians. Uh, and so the U.S. Uh, RAP program, the U.S. Refugee Admissions Program, is one potential avenue uh, that uh, we would seek to utilize to uh, reach that, uh, that number. Uh, but there are other programs and authorities uh, that we could potentially use, uh, including programs and authorities that would seek to uh, reunite uh, and reunify uh, families that have been separated because of uh, President Putin's uh, aggression in uh, Ukraine. Uh, but even as we work on these questions with our colleagues throughout the interagency, uh, we are already taking uh, drastic action uh, to support the humanitarian needs of those who have been internally displaced inside Ukraine uh, and the millions who have been forced to flee uh, their home country and who are now residing uh, in, in most cases, nearby European countries. We also know uh, that many uh, Ukrainians uh, want to stay in the region, and they want to stay in the region for a couple of reasons. In many cases, many of them have had to leave behind husbands, brothers, sons who are fighting this Russian aggression. Additionally, uh, there is every hope, and we share this hope, uh, that Ukraine will before long once again uh, be uh, a secure, uh, stable country uh, where Ukrainians can uh, return to. So our goal is in the near term uh, to support the humanitarian needs of IDPs inside Ukraine, refugees inside uh, Europe, and then uh, as appropriate and uh, given the level of demand uh, to welcome up to 100,000 Ukrainians to the United States using all uh, legal pathways available. But the ones who don't want to stay in the region, they would want to come now. And so you don't have anything in place now. You're not, you're not taking action right now. There are, are there are existing programs, uh, including the U.S. Refugee Admissions Program. Uh, there's the Lautenberg. There is the Lautenberg Program uh, that is uh, uh, very active right now. Uh, there are other uh, potential avenues. Uh, and what the president committed to was to accelerate and to expand the scope uh, of our ability to welcome. Uh, Ukrainians to the United States should they uh, choose to come here. Can I ask just another, on another sure. topic on um, Brittany Griner's case? Do you have any um, update? Have you tried to make a consular visit and, and been denied in the last month? 
and on Trevor Reed, uh, any response to his um, to the denial of his appeal today uh, and his statement in court that he's not getting any medicine and uh, or treatment for a broken rib. So when it comes to Brittany Griner, you heard us confirm that uh, an official from our embassy in Moscow had an opp opportunity to pay her a consular visit on March 23rd, uh, earlier this year. We have, beyond one-off consular visits, continued to insist uh, that Russian authorities allow consistent, uh, timely consular access to all U.S. citizens who are detained in Russia. That includes those uh, who are in pretrial detention, uh, including uh, Brittany Griner. We are in frequent contact uh, with her legal team, uh, with her broader network, uh, and we have no higher priority than the safety uh, and security of uh, Americans, including those uh, who are uh, incarcerated uh, in Russia. Similarly, uh, with uh, Trevor Reed, um, the appeals court in Moscow today denied Trevor Reed uh, the justice he deserves by uh, rem remanding his case to a lower court. As you know, Ambassador Sullivan uh, was in the court earlier today. He was able to talk to Trevor Reed uh, through a, a camera to briefly ask him about his health, uh, which does remain a concern, a concern of ours. Uh, the point with Trevor Reed is that he remains in prison for a crime he did not commit. And Ambassador Sullivan noted this earlier today, but the evidence at his trial was so flimsy that spectators and even court personnel laughed uh, during the proceedings. Uh, we know that uh, Trevor's health has uh, deteriorated. Uh, he is in the hospital in Mordovia. Uh, he has ex exhibited, as you heard today from Ambassador Sullivan, symptoms of uh, tuberculosis. Uh, we do believe that he needs urgent treatment uh, to prevent any further uh, deterioration in his medical condition. And we appeal once again uh, to the Russian government to provide a treatment plan and urgent medical care uh, so that his family can be, uh, can be assured that his health needs are being addressed. And above and beyond that, uh, we continue uh, to urge that he be uh, released, uh, given that uh, he is uh, being unjustly held and should be reunited with his family. Jenny. Thank you, uh, South Korea and Ukraine. Uh, pre Ukraine President Zelensky has uh, requested uh, WMD, I mean, weapons of mass destruction from the South Korea yesterday during he uh, gave a speech at the uh, South Korea's uh, National Assembly. Uh, and the South Korean government uh, refused to uh, provide WMD to Ukraine. What do you think of South Korea's refusal of this request? I'm not familiar with that specific request, but uh, any specific request that would come from uh, our Ukrainian partners to another government, we would have to refer to uh, that other government. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. This is justified because this WMD is uh, willing to provide the Ukraine, and the United States also provide the Ukraine for the WMD stuff. What, what we and our partners are providing Ukraine is a massive amount of security assistance uh, and precisely what our Ukrainian partners need uh, to defend themselves against Russian aggression. In the case of the United States, we've provided uh, over $2.4 billion worth of security assistance since the start of this administration, about $1.7 billion uh, over, the core, over the past uh, month alone. If you add in contributions from our partners and allies around the world, more than 30 countries that have provided security assistance to Ukraine since the start of this aggression, uh, aggression that number uh, grows even higher. And I think you can look at the effectiveness of that security assistance through a number of different lenses. As I said before, uh, Russia has lost the Battle of Kyiv. Uh, they lost the Battle of Kyiv as a result of the determination, the tenacity, the bravery, and the grit of the Ukrainian people. Uh, but what has enabled uh, Ukrainian resistance to this aggression is the massive amount of security assistance that the United States and our partners and allies from around the world have provided. And you can measure just the amount of that security assistance, uh, again, through uh, by a number of different ways. If you take, for example, uh, anti-tank systems that are currently in Ukraine. For every Russian tank currently in Ukraine, the United States alone has provided 10 uh, anti-tank systems. If you add, add in the contributions of our partners and allies, their anti-tank systems, that number and that ratio uh, goes up to 90, 90 anti-tank systems uh, for every single Russian tank in Ukraine. It is a similar ratio in terms of 
uh, anti-armored uh, systems. For every Russian armored vehicle, uh, the United States has provided three anti-armor systems. Uh, if you count the contributions of our partners and allies, that ratio goes up to 25 uh, to 1. And you can go almost across the board uh, in terms of Russian assets uh, in Ukraine and the amount of security assistance uh, that we have provided. What we're also doing uh, in, beyond uh, the scale and the size of that security assistance, we are providing our Ukrainian partners with precisely uh, the type of security assistance they've requested. Uh, you heard from uh, our colleagues yesterday that uh, we're going to be in a position to provide artillery, uh, and that will come as a direct result of uh, what we've heard from our Ukrainian partners. Uh, we uh, also announced on Friday, and our Slovak par partners announced on Friday, uh, that they would be transferring uh, the S-300 uh, long-range anti-aircraft system. That transfer uh, was uh, complemented and in some ways enabled uh, by the fact that we were able to backfill uh, that system uh, with the provision of a Patriot missile battery. Uh, so whether it is equipment from our own stocks, uh, whether it is our ability to backfill uh, what our partners and allies are then in turn providing, or whether it is what our partners and allies themselves uh, are providing, uh, we are making sure that every single day there is a delivery of much needed uh, and requested security assistance to our Ukrainian partners. And, and most importantly, it's security assistance uh, that is having a clear effect on the battlefield. Yes. Switch uh, topic. Uh, what is your comment uh, on the attacks in Israel and the Israeli military operation in Jenin camp? Well, we're deeply concerned with violence in Israel and the West Bank, uh, which we saw uh, continue, unfortunately, over the weekend, uh, and which has led to the deaths and injury of uh, Israeli and Palestinian civilians. We urge all sides to refrain from actions that escalate tensions and unrest and undercut efforts to advance a two-state solution. And we encourage all sides to work together uh, to end this cycle of violence. Yes. thousand civilians may have been killed in that city so far. Does the State Department have a sense of the civilian casualties um, in terms of numbers so far in Ukraine overall? And then I have another question about Mariupol. Apparently there are be, there are people that are being forcibly removed from that city and sent in, into either Russian controlled areas or Russian cities throughout the country of Russia. Do you know if that's happening? Does the U.S. have any evidence of that happening right now? So in terms of the death toll, uh, we are in a, in a position to attach a figure to that, primarily because the Battle of Mariupol continues. Uh, violence, in some cases unimaginable, unimaginable levels uh, of violence and brutality, uh, continue uh, to inflict uh, uh, grave harm on uh, the people there. So we've heard uh, estimates, but uh, until we have uh, and our Ukrainian partners in the first instance have a better sense of what has transpired on the ground, uh, we're just not going to be in a position to uh, attach a figure to that or to endorse uh, any um, uh, numbers. Uh, when it comes to reports of, of forced displacement, uh, we have seen these reports. We believe, uh, we believe some of them are credible. Uh, what we have consistently said is that uh, whether it's Mariupol or other besieged areas, uh, there need to be humanitarian corridors to allow people to leave on their own free will, uh, not to see to it that the only escape hatch they have is to a place like Russia or to the North Belarus, uh, but to areas that are not under siege. Uh, just as civilians should be allowed to leave, humanitarian assistance should be allowed uh, to enter, to flow in. We have not seen humanitarian corridors stick, certainly not to the extent that they should, uh, because of uh, one actor in this conflict, and that has been uh, the uh, Russian aggression, uh, even when uh, humanitarian corridors have been agreed upon. Missy. Can I follow up on um, Tamara's uh, question earlier about Finland and Sweden? Without speaking for NATO or speaking to their potential application, can you just say what um, the United States believes it would mean for NATO to have additional members with significant military, the kind of significant military capability that those countries have. As you know, they have a lot more military assets and bigger militaries than many other NATO countries. And if they're just, I'm just trying to get at what this would do to the deterrent or defensive power of the alliance. It's a difficult question to answer because I know you asked me to zoom out, but uh, I think by answering that question, I would necessarily need to zoom in on 
uh, to aspirant countries or potential aspirant countries uh, to the NATO alliance. But the point is that NATO is a defensive alliance. Uh, NATO now is more determined, uh, more committed, more purposeful uh, in those defensive aims precisely because we have seen Russia, uh, NATO's neighbor to the east, take aggressive action, take offensive action uh, against countries uh, in the region. There's a concern, of course, that uh, President Putin's aims uh, may not be confined uh, solely to Ukraine. Of course, uh, there are uh, pro-Russia forces uh, in Georgia, uh, uh, and uh, Russia is a country that has uh, meddled in other places as well, uh, certainly to include Moldova. Uh, so the reason, w again, without speaking to any other countries, uh, the reason we may be seeing additional interests in a defensive alliance is precisely because we've seen offensive operations and aggression uh, on the part of uh, the Russian Federation. So if there is any cause of increased interest uh, on the NATO alliance, uh, if there is anything that uh, at its core undergirds this sense of purpose, of unity, of determination uh, on the NATO alliance, uh, at the core of that, I think it's fair to say, is Vladimir Putin. Uh, one final question? Sure. Can I just ask something about Afghanistan? Um, does the U.S. have a, a hard number of how many American citizens are still in the country? How many of those people are trying to leave Afghanistan? And when was the last charter flight to take Americans out of the country? So we have made a commitment, as you know, to U.S. citizens, uh, to lawful permanent residents, uh, to those we have a special commitment uh, to help them uh, relocate from Afghanistan should they uh, choose to do so. Uh, those uh, efforts have been underway uh, since the end of the U.S. military evacuation. Uh, the number uh, is close to 1,000 uh, between American citizens, U.S. citizens, and lawful permanent residents who uh, have been directly relocated out of Afghanistan. Uh, with the assistance of uh, the U.S. government. When it comes to the estimate of uh, U.S. citizens who are still in Afghanistan, that's a number, as you know, that fluctuates because there have been uh, recent, um, uh, there, there have, we have recently been able to uh, affect the relocation of additional Americans uh, out of Afghanistan, uh, but uh, there are Americans who uh, will raise their hands, having seen the success uh, we've had. So we are in touch. Uh, with a number of Americans. We're continuing to do everything we can to support their desire uh, to relocate, and we will continue to do that as long as there are Americans uh, who wish to, to leave the country. Have there been flights that have been able to get out, though, recently? There, there have been recent flights. Do you have the number of hands of people who are in third countries still trying to get into the States? These are non-American non citizens. We can, we can, I think we can get you those, those numbers. On Jen Hyde, the Russian president, could you sure. speak to the decision and um, particularly th that it was based around the COVID restrictions, and do you view them, China says that they're based in science, do you view them as onerous, as uh, severe, as uh, a violation of, of folks' freedom of movement or anything like that? Well, uh, as you alluded to, Connor, uh, we did yesterday order the departure of non-emergency U.S. government personnel uh, and family members from our consulate general in Shanghai uh, due to two things. One, the ongoing uh, COVID-19 outbreak uh, in Shanghai, but also uh, the restrictions uh, related to the PRC's uh, response uh, to that outbreak. Uh, we previously were on authorized departure, and the move to order departure means that we are now, now mandating that all family members and certain employees uh, depart Shanghai rather than making this relocation decision voluntary. This reflects at its core our assessment uh, that it is best for our employees and their families to tempor temporarily uh, reduce in-country staffing uh, as we deal with changing circumstances uh, on the ground. Uh, there are commercial flights. We expect our employees and their family members will be able to depart Shanghai in the coming days on commercial flights. Ambassador Burns and other department and mission officials uh, have consistently raised our concerns about the safety and welfare of U.S. citizens uh, with PRC officials, including in the context uh, of the PRC's uh, COVID uh, restrictions. Uh, we've informed the government of the PRC about our order departure. Uh, and even as we draw down our staff at the Consulate General in Shanghai, uh, we continue to provide support to our U.S. citizen community throughout the PRC. Uh, we've adjusted staffing throughout the mission uh, to respond to the surge in demand for emergency citizen services, including uh, by standing up a team at the U.S. Embassy in Beijing to provide supplemental support 
to Consulate General Shanghai. And where conditions permit, uh, routine U.S. citizen and visa services remain open to the public, and facilities at the U.S. Consulate General in Shanghai uh, will be reopened, will reopen to the public uh, as soon as possible. Do you view these restrictions as um, too severe? Well, we are we have moved from authorized departure to order to order departure because of uh, the scale of the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, the uh, restrictions that have been placed by PRC authorities on uh, people in Shanghai, including uh, our diplomats and their families. Thank you all very much.